Welcome back to ECE 320A. We have three more lectures counting today in this class that are in the class. You will actually be provided with supplements for Unit 9 and maybe even Unit 10, I don't know. Stay tuned, but Homework 9 is due in a week on the 30th of April. Homework 10 is due on Reading Day a week from Thursday. And homework 10 is on filters, homework 9 is on Bodhi plots. Teacher course evaluations, they are still open. I haven't seen a high fraction. All I see is the percentage of students that have completed that. And it's not been real high, but I really do like to see what the students' comments are on that and be assured I don't see that until after grades have definitely been submitted or posted. So it won't impact your grade. Maybe I should qualify that in this course. <laughs> yes. No, no. I don't. I, the question was, do I see names associated? That all, everything on the TCE is anonymous. I think there are ways that I might find out who actually submitted. So that's an encouragement for more people to submit, meaning then it's more of an anonymous completion. If two people submit, I won't see the results. If I think more than five have to submit before I start seeing, and there's 70 plus of you in here, I would like to see a high fraction complete the TCEs, but it is, Anonymous. I don't see who says what or who bubbles in what particular value on the TCEs. The final exam is not on a Tuesday or a Thursday. It's actually on a Wednesday. Yes. I've so the comment was some faculty provide extra credit if the TCE fraction or percentage gets high. I've tried that and I've never reached my percentage. And so, pardon? Well, they're not, it probably isn't any harm, so stay tuned. Maybe I will ask or provide with a little incentive of extra credit, really. Anyway, we'll, we'll see about that. Yes. Can you what? Oh, now you're getting so specific. The question, <laughs> the question was, can that extra credit go towards the final? Does that mean you're finished for the semester and you want all possible points for the final? Uh, we're going to do a survey in here. But actually, I'm going to move that until the end so that you're doing that while I'm returning your exams and we'll save time. So I'm going to quit a little early today. Remind me or point, start pointing at the walls or somewhere and get my attention if I'm completely absorbed in the material, which is Bodiplot material today. Because I want to stop a few minutes early so that I can provide you with a survey, and the survey is not with this, with respect to this class. The survey is with respect to the stock room in the ECE building. If you haven't interacted with the stock room, it's going to be a straightforward survey to complete. You'll just say NA, not applicable. But if you have had interactions, we would like to hear those, not hear, but have you write down those in the two categories, weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses relative to the stockroom. That's the survey, and that will be at the end of class. Today what I want to do is try to motivate the need for Bodhi plots, and then we'll get into sketching those, and we probably won't go through all of the details about sketching, and that's why the supplements will be available in Unit 9 on D2L, and it will talk you through how to sketch numerator factors that are at the origin, linear factors that are in the numerator or the denominator, how we will actually approximate quadratic factors. We'll just rotate them around to their natural frequency and basically consider it to be a repeated linear factor. 
in order to sketch these complex factors. We won't worry about the damping ratio and how that influences the Bode plot. Let's then get started and now maybe you don't interact with stereo equipment anymore that might involve a graphic equalizer, but when you hear or see frequency response or Bode plot, maybe you can start thinking about a graphic equalizer. And what does that mean? This is supposed to represent frequencies that you might be listening to, and this material that you're listening to has a wide spectrum of frequencies, maybe from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz if you have young ears or undamaged ears. The left knob, let's say, influences the low frequencies or the bass. The high knob, the very high frequencies. And you can see then that the way these knobs are arranged, we're emphasizing the middle frequencies. That's what that means. This is a magnitude plot of the frequencies. How is this particular equalizer shaping signals that come in and then how do they go out? If it was a low pass filter, this, the, let's say the left three knobs would be level and high and then the right two knobs would be decreasing. And you can adjust these to say, oh, I want a high pass filter, which means I'm going to pass the high frequencies. Or in this case, it's more of a band pass filter. You're focusing on the middle band of frequencies that you want to pass. What we want to do is be able to sketch these shapes for the magnitude and the phase for any given transfer function that might describe our system. And in this class, our system is usually a filter or an, at least an electric circuit. And that's what we're dealing with. But you can think of this as another tool in your toolbox. We started with sinusoidal steady state analysis to work on power. Then we advanced through three-phase power. Then we moved into Laplace transforms and that was useful for solving differential equations by using algebra and knowing these transform pairs. Then we recently talked about convolution. How do we process or how does a system influence a signal that comes into it at the output? Today we're going to talk about frequency response and Thursday we will start talking about filters. But this is sort of our toolbox that you're accumulating in ECE 320A. And you'll need this material as you advance through your courses in ECE. So I would encourage you not to just do a memory dump after the semester because this material is useful for subsequent classes and hopefully for your career. Here's what we're looking at stated another way. We have our system and we can describe it in the time domain with the lower case or we know after this semester that shift happens. We can Laplace transform and that says that we can now look at this in the frequency domain. We can think of it in the time domain, we can think of it in the frequency domain, and that's why employers like electrical and computer engineers because they have this ability to think in both domains, time domain and frequency domain. They can look at a signal and say, oh, I can sort of understand what its frequency content looks like, and if that now gets processed through this system, I know what's going to happen. That's the mindset that you might want to have as we're going through the last part of this class. How do we look at or examine systems as filters, and how is that filter going to influence 
inputs that go in relative to the outputs that go out. And you know how that happens with sinusoids. If I now inject into that system a sinusoid, what am I going to get at the output? A sinusoid. What color am I? Not the color I wanted, but I'm not going to. And what's the frequency? The same as the input because we're dealing with linear systems. If we shake that system at the input, we're going to see that same frequency throughout our system or circuit. And that is useful information. What happens when we have a transient waveform at the input? What have we learned? So here I've sort of shown a ghost on the output, a ghost image of the input, but is that what we really see at the output? So what does it look like? Oh, so I see these shark fins, I think, that people are trying to produce with their hands. We're doing the wave here in class, but you might have something, let me just make it, that does something like that. And how sharp those exponential increases or exponential decays are, are determined by the system. If our system is fast or has a wide bandwidth, we're including more high frequency content and we might now have sharper shark fins or a output that looks more like the input. That's what happens relative to the frequency content and in the input x of t relative to what happens at the output or what is contained in the output waveform. If we put in a periodic waveform over the summer, you can read chapter 16. It's not a part of this class. It won't be on the final Fourier series, but any periodic waveform you can now represent as a Fourier series, which is really just a collection of sinusoids that are harmonically related. If you now know the fundamental frequency of a periodic waveform, you can say, oh, I probably have two times that omega naught, three times that omega naught, four times that omega naught content in my periodic signal, which is what you have. That's x of t there. Is that periodic that I listed just above? Is that a periodic waveform? No, that's a aperiodic, isn't it? That's not periodic, but if you repeated that pulse train periodically, then you could find a Fourier series representation of that waveform. And we know how to deal with sinusoids. That was on problem 8 of exam number 3. Oh, I just need to evaluate H at that frequency and evaluate H of J omega naught. And if you have inputs at discrete frequencies, omega naught, two omega naught, harmonically related frequencies, you could now find H of J omega naught, H of J two omega naught, H of J three omega naught, and know how, what the output looks like in the sinusoidal steady state. Meaning, once you have a sinusoid, you're going to have that same sinusoid at the output. That's what you just told me in the very first line when I said what happens when you have a sinusoid applied to a linear system. We might evaluate that at a particular omega naught, but now if we're seeing multiple frequencies of omega naught, omega naught, two omega naught harmonic content, then we might want to know what's H doing for all frequencies. And it's even more important when you go into Fourier transforms, which is a generalization of Fourier series, but now that allows you to talk about non-periodic waveforms. And again, that's going to be content that you start with in 340A. 
and that's a required class. So if you continue in ECE, then you will take 340A and you'll want to understand Fourier series, Fourier transforms in order to think about communications. And you'll then want to know how does that influence the output. Or in this blue highlight, you might want to know more than just h of j omega naught. You may want to know what is h of j for all frequencies omega. And that is the frequency response. Knowing what this complex number is at any given omega. If you put in an omega naught, then you put in an omega 1. Now you want h of j omega naught, h of j omega 1. That's a complex number. And how do we represent a complex number? As a magnitude and an angle, and that's now our magnitude plot and our phase plot versus frequency, which is the Bode plot. Now, mentally, that's what this yellow highlight means. Mentally, I said, oh, if you want h of j omega, that's the frequency response. Now you're thinking graphic equalizer. Or this is the top piece of the Bode plot, this graphic equalizer. That's the magnitude. We also want to figure out what's the phase relationship or what's the delay. It's, oh, it's related to the phase shift that you see or the phase versus frequency plot at each of the different frequencies. This frequency response information then tells us how our system is behaving to inputs at different frequencies. And that's what we want to start understanding. How can we, with a napkin or back of the envelope, how can we start sketching straight line approximations to these Bode plots. We don't have MATLAB with us at the restaurant. Maybe you do. It's, it's available on your phone while you're still in class or still at the university. So you could sketch that in, in MATLAB if you wanted to. And that's a way of checking your work. But being able to sketch this and understand, oh, what's this system doing at high frequencies? What's it doing at low frequencies? What's it doing in this range of frequencies? What's my magnitude doing? Is it sloping down? Is it sloping up? What is its slope in this interval of frequencies? All of that you'll be able to determine based on these straight line approximation sketches that you're going to now start to learn how to do. Let's start working through that by looking at some example systems. What are some types of systems that we might work with? And these systems that we're playing with, we are going to restrict those to linear, time invariant, minimum phase systems. Minimum phase means that all of our poles and zeros are in the left half complex S plane. So if somebody says you have a minimum phase system, that means that your poles and zeros are in the complex left half S plane, or the LHP if you're texting. So the left half S plane. And what we want to do now, and what's it mean by time invariant? If I gave you a circuit and said, is this circuit time invariant, what would you be looking at or thinking in that question. AC? So if it's time invariant, then the circuit itself is invariant with respect to time. What that means is we're assuming that the resistors, the capacitors, and the inductors are not changing with time. They're fixed. We're not letting them be variable as a function of time. They're time invariant. 
So now if I hand you a 100 ohm resistor, you're going to assume that that's always 100. If I give you a capacitor, a 1 microfarad capacitor, okay, this is what I have. It's not changing with time. In reality, it probably will. But over a certain time interval that we're analyzing it, this is a valid assumption that it's time invariant. Linear, now that allows us to use superposition. That's why it's useful to know what's this system doing at omega naught, what's it doing at 2 omega naught. I can add these results together. Let's now work through some example transfer functions. Suppose we have h sub 1 of s given as follows. 10 s plus 1 upstairs, that's the numerator term, and downstairs we have two factors, s plus 20 and s plus 1000. That's in the pole zero form because the poles and zeros are, I hope, screaming at you. You can see that I have a zero, a finite zero, at s equal minus one. Or what value of s causes that numerator to vanish is how I might say. Or, and we have two poles. And where are my poles and zeros located? the left half plane. They're all negative. This is s equal minus 20, s equal minus 1,000 that cause those factors to vanish. To sketch the Bode plots, we really don't want this in pole zero form. For the pole zero diagram in the s plane to put down, to pitch our tent, to put in our infinite poles and our thumbtacks on these rubberized sheets, the pole zero form is ideal. We now know we have a 0 at minus 1, a pole at minus 20, and another pole at minus 1,000. But to sketch the Bode plots, it's better to get rid of these, or these adjustable, well, what do I want to say, these pole locations and 0 loca locations. We want to normalize those to 1 and put this in time constant form, put the poles and zeros effectively underneath the s's. If we're doing that, we simply factor out the pole and zero locations in these linear factors. In this case, I'm going to be very direct with the numerator. I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to factor 1 and, Ill and let me explicitly show what that is, well this is now factored out and I now have s divided by 1 plus 1. You can see that that's not necessary, but now I've explicitly shown you where my 0 is. But my time constant is 1 over 1 or 1. Tau is 1 over the 0. What if I wanted to do the denominator? I'm trying to put this into time constant form, which means make the constants equal 1. So I factor out a 20. And I factor out a 1,000. I now can collect all of those gain values into one gain number, and that's now my gain that I will use to plot in my Bode plot. I now have 10 divided by 20, or 1 half, and then divide that by 1,000. Or I have 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3 as my gain for h sub 1 of s in time constant form. I have a pole at minus 20, and I have another pole at minus 1,000. And again, if you leave it in that form, you can still see the poles and zeros. But if somebody wanted it in time constant form, now your time constant is 1 over 20. Here the time constant is 1 over 1,000, or 0 0.001. That's the, the game we're playing. Let's look at another one. Suppose now I give you the following 
transfer function. 20 times s over s plus 10 and s plus 500. Put that in time constant form. What do I have in the denominator? I simply factor a 10 out of that first factor and I factor a 500 out of the second factor. And what terms can you identify? What are some individual terms that you see in this transfer function? What's your constant equal to? No, not the time constant, the constant of h sub 2 of s. What scales all the other factors? All my other factors are now in time constant form. I do have here is an S in the numerator. That's an S at the origin. This is a new, this is a zero at the origin. And so I'll say, oh, we have a, do we have a pole or a zero at the origin? That's important when you're sketching Bode plots. Here, we have a zero at the origin. And that's important to know in sketching Bode plots. But now I'm also asking, what's the gain value that we will have to plot in a Bode plot? Well, that will be 20 divided by 10 divided by 500. You combine all of these by multiplying and dividing, and that's now your constant that you will be concerned with in your Bode plot. What other terms are in this transfer function? Hopefully you see that you have a linear pole factor with a pole at 10 and you also have another linear pole factor, s over 500 plus 1. And we will now need to sketch each of these colored terms in our Bode plot. We'll have to learn how to sketch a zero at the origin, a gain, and linear pole factors. Let's do another one. Suppose I now give you h sub 3 of s, and it looks like 50 times the factor s plus 2 over s times s plus 10. and put this in time constant form. It's not hard to put it in time constant form, but it it's probably helpful, just like the convolution when I say we're flipping and sliding, we want to flip first and then make it be capable of being slid. Here, we want to essentially factor out those constant terms so that the constant in all of our linear factors and eventually quadratic factors is 1. Or now we have 50. We factor out the 2. And then we have s, 10, s over 10 plus 1. Our constant now is 10. And if we take 20 log of 10, did I do the math right? That's 100 divided by 10, so that's 10. 20 log of 10, log of 10, 
log of 10 base 10 is 1 times 20. So that's 20 dB. Now we'll sketch a line that's 20 dB for all frequencies. That's about as easy as you can get for that particular gain in a Bode plot. You just draw a flat line for all omega at 20 dB. And that's the contribution that this gain makes in H sub 3 of S to your frequency response. Then what do we have? We actually have something else at the origin this time. We have a pole at the origin. And that does just the opposite as what a zero at the origin does. A pole at the origin now is sloping down because it's a pole, it has a negative slope, it's sloping at 20 dB per decade, but it's always sloping. It never breaks. That's always sloping so that at low frequencies, somebody now might ask you, what's the DC gain of H sub 3 of S? What would you say? What's the DC gain of H sub 3 of S? So now if you evaluate H sub 3 at 0, what happens? We divide by 0. Is that allowed? So it's undefined, isn't it? It's going really, really big. But on a Bode plot, we're plotting log of this magnitude. So it, we never get to 0 with a Bode plot. It just keeps going up and up and up. And how fast is it going? 20 dB per decade. And at omega equal to 1, this is now a sweet spot relative to the poles and zeros at the origin. If you just looked at what I have highlighted in yellow and I said, what's the magnitude of that term at omega equal to 1, what would you say? Now you're evaluating H sub 3 of J at 1 for only this 1 over s term. So you say 1 over j1 and find the magnitude of that. What's the magnitude of j? What's the magnitude of the square root of minus 1? What's the magnitude of the square root of minus 1? That's a head scratcher, isn't it? It's 1. So now, 1 over j1, what's the magnitude? If you now said, where am I at j1? This pole is where? You've now put a stake in the ground at the origin. And you say, or a pole. You put a pole at the origin, and you walk to j1. How far did you walk? 1. That's the distance. Now, we have this guy at 1, giving us a magnitude of 1 at, that's the actual magnitude. What's its magnitude in dB? We take log of 1. What's log of 1? 0. We multiply that by 20. 0. So we have 0 dB at omega equal to 1. So this straight line, if you're playing pin the magnitude plot on the paper, this is a good parlor game. Parlor. Okay, it's a good ECE game. <laughs> now, pin the magnitude plot on the screen or on the paper. Where do you pin it? You pin this 20 dB per decade slope at 0 dB at omega equal to 1. And that's now your magnitude plot associated with this pole at the origin. It's always giving you a slope of 20 dB per decade. What else do we have? We have a 0 factor. It's upstairs, so when we break at 2, we missed our break at 2. <laughs> but now we have a break at 2 radians per second, not p.m. or a.m. You can take a break at 2 a.m. when you're sketching these. And you're going up at plus 20 dB per decade. 
The poles are downstairs. They give you a slope down from beyond the break frequency. That's the magnitude. And you have to uh, account for all of these in a sketch of a Bode plot. One more, H sub 4. Suppose now it's 20, S plus 100 over S times S plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. And we want to now do our agreed to conversion or approximation of this transfer function in order to sketch its Bode plot. What terms do we have? We're going to have a constant term. We're going to have a pole at the origin. We're going to have a linear zero. And now what do we have? Now we have complex poles. But we're going to basically sort of move away from worrying about them as being complex and just approximate those as two linear poles. And the way that we're going to do that, what if you now multiplied this out? Suppose you now said, oh, this is s squared plus 6s plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. And this I selected to give me this 3, 4, 5 triangle. So that 3 squared plus 4 squared, 9 plus 16, 25, that's 5 squared. So now you take this, and this guy, this 5, is actually our natural frequency. Associated with this set of complex poles. If you looked at where these are in the complex plane, it's minus 3 plus and minus J4. How far away are they from the origin? 5, because it's this right triangle. That's our natural frequency. So what you can think of in this approximation that we're going to do is we were at minus 3 plus and minus J4. We're going to rotate those around, staying the same distance away from the origin until both of those complex poles are real. And they will now be 5 units into the left half plane. Our approximation that we are going to do in this class is we're going to now say, oh, this is approximately S plus 5 squared. And we're neglecting that damping. And now we simply have a linear factor duplicated. So if you can sketch linear factors, either numerators, which are zeros, or poles, which, or denominators, which are poles, if you can sketch poles and zeros at the origin, and if you can sketch constants, you can now do the straight line of Bode plot approximations that we want to do in this class. If this is now how we are approximating this complex pole pair as two real poles at omega sub n, at 5 in this case, how do we now approximate or find this in time constant form. We have 20, we have 100. S over 100 plus 1. Then we have S, and now what do we do? I think that initially it might be easier to sort of think of this in this way, and now you can more cleanly convince yourself of what this looks like
when we factor it into time constant form. We now have, and that's why I write script S's because those fives look like S's, those are fives. In our denominator we now have S times 5 squared over S plus 5 plus 1 squared. And this is now our time constant approximation for this h sub 4 of s's denominator. Or if this is confusing, don't even square it, just keep the two linear factors that are identical. s over 5 plus 1 times s over 5 plus 1. Oh, I can sketch a linear factor. Questions on that? Yes. The question was, what are we doing? If, if I now ask you, if I gave you h sub 4 of s and said, where are the poles and zeros, you would find the poles are at minus 3 plus and minus j4. Now, if I said sketch the Bode plot, then in this class we are agreeing with a wink and a nod that we're going to not worry about these complex poles and just make them two real repeated poles. So now you would say, oh, for our Bode plot, we're going to sketch this as if we had two real poles at minus 5. And this is now how you would do it. And now the time or the constant would be 20 times 100 divided by 25 squared. I'm divided by 5 squared. Okay. So let's now look at an example of how we might work with this idea of Bode plots. And here's an active filter. Active meaning we have to energize the circuit in order for it to function or in order for it to operate. And that is what this op amp needs. It needs to be, and it's not shown here in the diagram, but implicitly understood in this picture is the fact that we have now energized this op amp so that it's functioning the way we want our op amp to function. We have an input voltage applied through a resistor, R sub 1, and then we have negative feedback, which is a good thing. That now keeps this op amp operating in its linear operating range. And the feedback impedance is now a parallel combination of a resistor and a capacitor. Which now means that we actually have some memory in this circuit because we have an energy storage device. A capacitor does not charge up instantly and discharge instantly. It takes some time to charge up and discharge. And that lag in our system gives us this dynamic behavior. We don't have instantaneous output due to a given input. We have some filtering going on. We have some frequency behavior of this circuit. Now that you have this sketched, I'm going to quickly go through the analysis. I'm just going to scroll through it. How are we going to analyze this? Well, I've already given you a hint. We are going to just simply write KCL at the inverting node, at V sub N. And then we are going to notice that if we're, we now have this negative feedback, the inverting and non-inverting terminals are essentially at the same potential. There's a virtual short, so this 
net inverting terminal is effectively grounded or at zero volts. And here I'm saying the current going into that because the op amp has such a high impedance is effectively zero. We're, neg we're neglecting the current going into that inverting terminal. And if we now do KCL at that inverting terminal, we now say, oh, the current going to the left must equal the current, or let's say the sum of the currents equals zero. Left current plus right current equals zero. And you can write the equations for the current going left and the equation for the current going right. And we'll simply realize that this feedback impedance, Z sub F, is the parallel combination of R sub 2 and the impedance of your capacitor, which is 1 over SC, and that simplifies as a ratio of polynomials in S to R sub 2 over S R sub 2 C plus 1. And that particular formula for this impedance is actually in time constant form automatically. The constant is 1. It's been normalized to 1. There's our KCL equation. We have the inverting voltage minus the input voltage. That's the voltage drop across R1. That's the current going left. We have V sub N minus the output voltage divided by the impedance in the feedback capacitor. That's the current going right. And we just tried to argue that V sub N was zero. If that's the case, this now simplifies. If we push V naught on the other side, we have V naught over Z sub F is equal to minus V sub I over R1. If we cross multiply, we end up with our transfer function. The transfer function between our input voltage and the output voltage is now minus Z sub F over R1. And we have the equation for Z sub F. That was right here. Now let's just divide that by R1. And we can do the division in the numerator so that our transfer function now is simply minus R2 over R1. This minus just means we're inverting the output versus what comes in at the input divided by S R sub 2 C plus 1. And that you should recognize as a low pass filter. Where your time constant is RC, or in this case R sub 2 times C, whatever R sub 2 is and whatever C is. And that would determine the break frequency in this low pass filter. What we want to do now is sketch the straight line approximation to this transfer function that is a function of frequency. It does have an S somewhere in the numerator and the denominator. It's not just a constant. We have some frequency behavior of this transfer function and in fact you can see that as a low pass filter. Why can you see that as a low pass filter? Start simply thinking about S as J omega, or you could say, do you have any finite zeros? Do you have any finite values of S that cause the numerator to vanish? No. So we don't really have to worry about zeros. We do have a gain. 
R2 over R1. So that will establish, and what's the DC gain of this? Just let's say it's magnitude. Forget about the minus sign. But what's the DC gain? R2 over R1. So if R2 was equal to R1, we would have a DC gain of 1. Or in dB, log of 1, 0. So we would have 0 dB if R2 was equal to R1. So our DC gain is 0 dB. Then we hit this pole. And that's our break frequency or the cutoff frequency. And that pole is determined by the value of s that causes the denominator to vanish. Here I've tried to sketch the straight line approximation, which is solid. That's what you want to draw in this class. The actual curve, which is what you would get from, boat, from MATLAB if you did this in MATLAB. Boy, I get somebody's attention anytime I say MATLAB. That's this dashed line. And the actual, that's the actual curve. And obviously this is not really the actual curve because I drew it. But if it was the actual curve, it would look a little bit better. But we will show that in fact, in the actual curve at the cutoff frequency for a linear factor, we are 3 dB down from the break point at that cutoff frequency or break frequency. We started our maximum DC val gain value and then we start rolling off. And how fast are we rolling off? At what rate, maybe I shouldn't say fast, what rate are we rolling off? How many poles did we have? One. And if it's a linear factor, which this is, this is one linear factor, it's going down at 20 dB per decade. That's the slope. That's the rate that it's decreasing. And here I'm just talking us through some of this analysis that we just discussed. Our pole is the value of s that causes that denominator to vanish or to equal zero and that's when s is equal to minus one over r2c or in terms of the time constant that's just one over tau the time constant tau is rc r sub 2c in this case and the dc gain is what you said it was it's h of s when s is equal to zero. And this one is meaningful because we don't have a pole at the origin. When we have a pole at the origin, what's our dc gain? It's undefined, but we know that it's just continuing to get bigger in our Bode plot. Here's the analysis that I said we would do. At the cutoff frequency, what does this transfer function produce in terms of its magnitude? The cutoff frequency is the break frequency, and that's 1 over tau, or that's 1 over r sub 2c. This was now s r sub 2c. We replaced s with j omega, and we're now replacing omega with 1 over r sub 2c. The r sub 2 c's cancel in that term, and this is the beauty behind putting it into time constant form. We always have this real piece equaling 1. That is always fixed. And now with the r c's canceling, we have a magnitude of 1 plus j in the denominator. And if you just looked at that distance in the complex s plane, you said, oh, starting at the origin, and now if you walk to 1 plus j and find out how far are you from the origin, that's just the square root of 2. So the magnitude of 1 plus j is the square root of 2.
now we have reduced our DC gain by dividing by the square root of 2. Square root of 2 is 1.414. And what is that in dB? We take 20 log base 10 of 1 over the square root of 2. Well, now let's just play with our logarithm knowledge. And that says, oh, if we have something in the denominator, or if we have a quotient, we can subtract the logs. We now have 20 times the quantity log of 1 minus the log of square root of 2. Square root of 2. Well, square root of 2 we can write as 2 raised to the 1 half power because we know how to use powers when we take logarithms. That power now comes out front. The 20 times 0 we don't even worry about. That's 0 and we have 20 scaled by a minus 1 the one-half in the exponent of the argument of the log comes out front, and we take the log of 2. And I know you all have the log of 2. This is an approximate, but it's approximately 0.3. The log of 2 is approximately 0.3. 20 times one-half, that's a hard problem. That's 10. We now have minus 10 log 2, which this is approximately 0.3. We increase that by a factor of 10. We move the decimal point. There is our minus 3 dB adjustment because of this division by the square root of 2. And where did that come from? That came about because we were actually up the imaginary axis. We were the same distance up the imaginary axis as the pole was in the real, on the real axis. And that was this 45 degree angle. And that's going to be important when we start talking about the phase contribution of that pole. Here we were just worrying about the magnitude or the distance we were away, and that's this square root of 2 distance. Let's now look at a general first order transfer function. And now if you're really being observant, you've seen that I now have scrolled down. Now I can just slow down and start writing. So I promised I would finish early, but not this early. But here is our first order transfer function. It's in time constant form. If it was in pole zero form, you know how to convert it. Just factor out all the poles and zeros and collect those into the gain, which I might call k. In this particular transfer function, how many terms do, am I going to have to sketch? in the Bode plot. How many terms do you see staring at you in this transfer function? Here I'm counting constants as a term. I'm going to have a constant term and I'm going to have a pole factor term. So I'm going to have to put two pieces together for both the magnitude plot and the phase plot. To see what we're actually going to end up with, let's just look at h of j omega in terms of its magnitude and phase. So if we look at the magnitude, we now look at 20 log, and this is now log base 10, and I'll probably get sloppy and not include that base 10 in all of my logs. I'll just say L-O-G. And now we're looking at the magnitude of H of J omega. Or, for this particular 
transfer function, that's k over j omega tau plus 1. And we know how to work with arguments of the log when we have products or quotients. Here we have a quotient. So we subtract this denominator factor to end up with our overall magnitude. We now look, are looking at 20 times the log of the magnitude of k minus 20 log of the magnitude of j omega tau plus 1. And now we need to learn how to sketch these two pieces. 20 log of k, does that depend on frequency? No. As long as we found k, this will just be a number, and we can just draw that straight line. And I'm going to allow you, on the final, to bring a ruler or a straight edge. And, well, the final might be multiple choice, so I may not dock you if it's not completely straight. All right, so now, what about the second term? It is a function of omega, and we are going to have to figure out what does it look like. And here, we are going to go into <coughs> fairy tale land. Goldilocks. Question? <laughs> it might be multiple choice, the final. Just getting you ready. So now what we want to do is look at this factor in terms of these goggles that we've now put on that say something about Goldilocks. Goldilocks was kind of too hot, too cold, just right. Well, here we're going to have frequencies that are a little low, a little high, and just right the Goldilocks frequency. And what do you think the Goldilocks frequency is going to be? Just right. But the just right frequency is the break frequency. That's what we'll look at. But before we do that, let's look at the phase. We haven't really talked about the phase. Let's talk. look at the phase. Of H of J omega. Now we're looking at the angle. of this transfer function, which is now the angle of k over j omega tau plus 1. But we know how to treat products and quotients in terms of their angles. These are now e to the j something divided by some e to the j something. So we're adding and subtracting the angles of each of the complex numbers associated with this expression. Or in this case, we have the angle of our numerator. The numerator was just a constant k minus the angle of the complex number associated with the denominator factor. And in each of these expressions, what I'm trying to make clear is that we had two different colors. We have two different terms. We have two terms in the magnitude, and we have two terms in the phase. And we have to learn how to sketch those two terms and then add them up. Question. What is the angle of K? What is the angle of K? What is K? So good. These are good questions. These, these are questions you're going to be struggling with maybe, and let's just clear them up now. What is K? K was a real number, wasn't it? It was 
20 times 10 divided by 1,000 something. It was a real number. But it could be negative, couldn't it? If we now look at the angle of a negative number, now we're, st we're still in the complex plane, so you could think of that as a complex number. Now I'm standing at the origin in the complex plane, and I say, oh, if this is 20, where is 20? Well, it's on the real line, and where am I looking? What's the angle that I'm looking at to see 20? Zero degrees. Now if it's negative, if it was now minus 30, now I have to go all the way over there. <laughs> all the way over here, and what's that? That's minus 180, isn't it? It's plus 180 or minus 180. You get to the same point. Let's just use, well, in this class, this you could say if it was negative, we're just going to say it's minus 180 because usually we have lags occurring, and that's a negative angle. So we'll just agree that if this is a negative, that now corresponds to minus 180. But if it was a positive number, then we would have to draw zero degrees for all frequencies. That you don't even have to draw. You just draw the axis and there's your angle contribution due to that constant. You're sketching zero degrees for all omega. If it was a negative number, then you're doing this and you go, oh, no matter what omega is, I'm this does not depend on omega, does it? It's minus 180 for all frequencies. So now you would get out your straight edge and draw that straight line at a value of minus 180 for all frequencies. And then we have to figure out how to sketch this guy. How and So we have two terms. that we have to learn how to sketch. We have a, the gain term and the pole factor linear term. And we'll have to figure out how to sketch those maybe by taking supplements. So you'll look for supplements in unit nine, is that where we're at now, on D2L to learn how to sketch these different pieces.